So, good evening, folks. Really appreciate everyone showing up tonight. I'm really excited to introduce Father Kafreshi. And uh, hopefully, you've been enjoying a lot of the images and the movies and set up. But uh, I think we'll have more to come. So, it's really exciting. We plan to change things up and everyone stay in their seats. We're going to have a business meeting after Bobic's uh, talk tonight. Um, so hopefully you'll uh, take a moment to thank Bobic for coming. Uh, and I also wanted to say um, that you have more books for sale? Yeah. Uh, for after the, after the meeting? And he probably will love to sign them also. So um, if you didn't get one. book any good? <laughs> Get a free All right. Yeah. All right. Um, so, welcome, uh, Bobby. Thank you very much. is historically very important. Some of the most remarkable astronomers of the past century have given lectures here, communicated ideas, um, because the importance of this center, the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, in the past uh, 150 years, revolutionized astronomy in many fields. This is also called square D. But yeah. talk was back in 2005. I was in, invited by Atma, um, and at the time I was uh, still living in Iran. So I gave a talk about astronomy in Iran in 2005 here. But the next ones were mainly about my photography. In the past five years, I've been living in Boston area. Uh, we moved from Germany to here. Um, because of my work with National Geographic, um, I had to move from Europe to, to the US. And this work has been my main passion and job in the past 20 years. I've been partly science journalist doing um, articles and TV programs on astronomy and space uh, before I moved more towards professional photography. Uh, but since 97, 96, I've been selling photos and doing assignments. So that's kind of professional uh, photography. But it has never been a deeper sky photography. It, I, I do it time to time as a hobby, and I really enjoy it. But my way of expertise is mainly connecting Earth and sky in a single photograph. So the image needs to be a single real photo. That's my personal taste. Um, and I continue it from the film time. And it has to include some connection to the Earth. And I will tell you why this connection is important to me and why we use it to deliver messages, uh, especially the message of protecting the night sky and the value of natural night. This is an early morning, right at sunrise in Rio, when hundreds or thousands of frigate birds are coming back from nearby islands where they stay overnight to mainland Rio. At the time of full moon setting, uh, the sun is rising. Night sky is not necessarily a laboratory to astronomers. It is, of course, a laboratory to astronomers, but within a much larger context, 
It's an essential element of life. It's a natural heritage for every life on this planet. Some of the species are completely dependent to natural night environment. Their life is based on lunar cycles. Their life is based on navigating by stars. And their life is based on hiding in the natural darkness or seeing their prey in moonlight. And by changing that, we change the habit and lifestyle of millions, billions of the species on this planet. And this is happening now with light pollution. So the project I'm doing, The Word at Night, with my team in 20 countries is partly related to revealing the importance of preserving natural night environment. Now we travel across the world from Rio to Australia. This is the southern coast of Australia where you see the Milky Way sinking into the southern ocean. You're looking to the south where there is no light pollution because you're looking towards Antarctica. There is no, nothing on the horizon until the next uh, 5,000 miles. That's why the Milky Way is completely visible on the horizon and you, you can in fact barely see kind of shadow here. What is the source of light for this shadow? Just the center of the galaxy. When it's dark enough, you can see illumination by the galactic core. You can see some illumination sometimes by planet Venus in the photograph. You don't see it with your bare eyes, but you can see it in a long exposure. Just above the rocks, that red nebulosity is Lagoon, or M8, very familiar to those of you who are avid stargazers in this room. One of the brightest nebulae in the sky. Visible to the eye, but without the color. The color is easily captured by a camera. Especially the camera I'm using here is modified for astrophotography. That means it's receiving more of the red light at the end of the spectrum compared to a regular camera. That's where most of these red emission nebulosity are shining. Across the world, now we are in Nepal. <coughs> That's Lutsi, the fourth highest mountain next to Everest. And this is the very impressive peak called Amadabna. Very technical to climb. We were kind of altitude sick at this altitude. It was only 4,000 meters. So that means 12,000 feet. And for climbers, this is nothing. But we got very fast up there. Our colleague Sherpa told us that you should stop on the way before getting to this altitude at least for one night. I told him, no, you're going to charge us for some money. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it in one day. So with heavy um, imaging equipment, me and my colleague Oshin, we went all the way up and got altitude sickness. Then this climber came down from top of Amadabla. He was uh, skiing down and then came down and as soon as he got to us, uh, Ah, oh, fresh oxygen, so much oxygen here. <laughs> <laughs> this image is completely illuminated by moon. I use the moonlight as one of my main source of illumination because it's uniform, it's just showing the natural colors, and it's very easy to handle. Also, it's very good for places with some light pollution because it removes that uh, yellow cast of the artificial light in the sky and replaces it with this very dramatic, beautiful blue in the sky. But if the moon is too bright, then it becomes a problem. On the same night, I was waiting for the moon set. These are some of the scenes that people usually don't see first because of the place, but most important, it's in midnight. Most people are sleeping. And then we got disconnected from this part of nature because of living in the cities within light pollution. Look how Fascinating it is, the change of light when the moon is gone. Mars is rising, and darkness comes. In a moonless night in Yellowstone National Park of Wyoming, this hot spring is illuminated by a portable LED light. 
bright star Antares is right on the shoulder of the spring, um, right here. This is the heart of a scorpion. One of the frequent uh, places uh, frequently I visit is Atacama Desert in Chile. The reason it's known as astronomer's paradise, there are many observatories in the Atacama being very dry with more than 300 clear nights per year on average at some of these sites, 300, and being far from light pollution. So it's a paradise to astronomers, but quite a hell to any other species, especially when you look at some of these locations like Cerro Paranal, the place for the very large telescope. You look around for many miles, there is no sign of life. There is not even one single vegetation. It looks like walking on Mars. But the night the sky is beautiful, and Atacama has a very diverse uh, landscape. Like this cactus forest, um, volcanoes on the border of Bolivia, uh, reaching up to 6,000 meters, and here comes the night. The beginning of the night is dominated by a yellow cast of light and the green one from air glow, natural emission of the Earth upper atmosphere, colorless to the eye but not to the camera. Then the Milky Way begins to rise right above Likan Kabur, very famous volcano on the border. By midnight, the last quarter moon is going to come from there and almost vanish everything. It looks like sunrise. Further down in the desert, there is another favorable stargazing location, especially in winter nights in the Atacama. This area has more moderate temperature. This is not far from the town of San Pedro de Atacama, which is a very hot touristic place. Uh, because of so many attractions nearby, you can see the line of volcanoes reflected on the water. Now we are in Cerro Paranal home to the very large telescope, but this is not a telescope. This is the residency, the hotel for astronomers. They're living underground to mm, completely preserve humidity and control the temperature. They have built the amazing residency underground. There is even a tropical forest here, small tropical forest right under here with a very nice pool next to it. You can imagine anything an astronomer wants is available there. A good kitchen, too, by the way, <laughs> which is not really common in observatories, I can tell you. I've been to many of these observatories in the world, and um, kitchen is one of the main problems. Because <laughs> <laughs> you can't really invite a cook you know, to the middle of a desert to stay there for a couple of years. And uh, this place is amazing. One side because of the telescope, the other side the facilities they have designed. Now we are zooming in towards the galaxy, but not exactly the Milky Way. We're going to find a single satellite in the backdrop. Can you see it? It's a geostationary satellite. 35,000 kilometers away from us, one of the many thousands responsible for relaying our TV and radio signals. Well, this is uh, not really East. You're the first people to see it. I edited today. <laughs> it's from a recent trip to Guatemala, and you will be the first audience to see a video of this night as well at the end of the talk. Uh, we then draw the galaxy flying above this volcano. This is a dormant volcano, but not this one. The very famous Fuego, or fire volcano in Guatemala, took lives of many hundreds um, just last year. Because when it erupts, it erupts every 10 minutes. So very active, one of the world's most active volcanoes, every 10, 15 minutes. But a massive eruption last year happened in a way that people didn't manage to escape evacuation didn't happen in time, bad management, and some people didn't believe that magma is coming towards them, and also the blast. Um, so locals claim even 4,000 people are buried, but officials saying 200, so it's a big difference. 
So I was there, but not that close. I was close to another one, you will see. It's in the next picture in, in, at the end. Another volcano, also active, not in Central America, but in Iran. This was only two of, one and a half hour drive from my previous home when I was still based in Iran. Uh, I was living in Tehran, and this is only 45 miles from the capital, and active, but last erupted six, seven thousand <coughs> years ago. So it's not that dangerous, but people are monitoring it in case it um, suddenly erupts. It's a very important mountain for uh, the culture and um, mythology of Persian culture. Um, it has been always in the Persian mythology since um, you can find any evidence in the back. Uh, it's called Mount Damavant. The altitude is 5,600 meters, or roughly about 16,000 feet, 16,700 feet. Where is the lava coming from in the picture? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. It's coming from a car. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of them are here from that six, 7,000 years ago. So these are all a solidified lava, but this is a car passed by on this mountain road. I was waiting for that, in fact. And all the illumination, again, is from the moon. You're looking towards Polaris, and with the Earth rotation in this one hour, everything is rotating in the sky. If you stand still with your camera for about one hour, half an hour, then you get the circumpolar trails because of the Earth rotation. If you continue that for 12 hours, it will be 180 degrees arc. 24 hour, impossible in this latitude, then you get complete circle. If you're in North Pole or South Pole, then you can do that. This type of photography is not easy in many places, and you can see why. Airplanes. In many parts of the world, airplanes are dominating the sky. And now we are worried about satellites too, the mini satellites like a Starlink. When they come, become more real, with thousands of them above, they're at magnitude between three to seven, uh, depending on what part of the orbit they are. The beginning of the orbit, they're even brighter too, and they're just going up. And these are planes approximately between magnitude one to four. So that means anything up to four or five is easily visible in a night escape photo. If you use a faster lens, more sensitive camera, you can easily go to magnitude eight, nine in 20 second exposure. And these satellites, although they're mainly a threat to deep sky photographers and astronomers, they can be visible to night escape photos as well. And this would be a topic in an article in Sky Telescope magazine in March uh, coming up. Um, my colleague has done extensive work on that. And there was a recent article on the website too. So anyhow, this is Grand Canyon by moonlight and airplanes. If you want to have a clean image without these um, satellites and airplanes, you have to wait after midnight, 2, 3 in the morning. Some of the images are more on the technical side. Although we try to represent the night sky, which could be appreciated by unaided eyes, some of the images are much more deep. They're not only deeper, they're very at the very edge of the technology, like this one. I couldn't believe my eyes when I captured a single exposure photo last year, because 10 years ago, this was completely unbelievable, un un impossible. But now it is. First thanks to very sharp, fast lenses working at wide open. I was using 105, 105 millimeter telephoto by Sigma art at 1.4, completely wide open. Second, the cameras are modified for astrophotography. This is Nikon D810A, made for astrophotography. Now we have Canon EOS RA, made for astrophotographers. And uh, exposure is 15 seconds tracked on uh, a tracker during this 15 seconds at half the speed, which is one of my tricks in order to balance between the blurring landscape due to tracking and the trailing stars due to non-tracking. 
it's a bit technical, but for the, those of you who have done astrophotography, you can almost uh, understand what I'm talking about. Uh, but just imagine 15 seconds, single exposure, and you can reveal some of the very faint emission nebulosity. This is cat's paw in uh, scorpion. Or this is the row of Yuki in uh, just around Antares. It's a mix of emission and reflection nebulosity. A typical question I receive is that, what can we see of the Milky Way with unaided eye? Are we able to see this? No, this is an enhanced image. The Milky Way is enhanced in this picture, and I, by purpose, used uh, a bit saturated image to show you what would be uh, a too much enhanced image, and what would be the experience of unaided eye. Well, yeah, we have to, I was happy with the um, color balance of the projector, but no longer. <laughs> <laughs> Something has changed, or maybe the contrast. The see it up on the monitors. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Is it better? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, it's always that way. Well, it's a big difference. <laughs> Grant International <laughs> Park. So which one is the real color of the Milky Way? Left. Left. So for an experience, um, it was a test. I posted this one on social media 10 years ago. It was with a modified camera. It didn't change the white balance. So if you do it with a modified, self-modified camera, the white balance is completely off. You have to balance it before releasing it. But I didn't, just to test the reaction of the public. And a day later, I posted that one and mentioning that this is the real color. I received 10 times more likes on this image. <laughs> so that explains why people tend to release these exotic images of the Milky Way online nowadays. And the whole you know, social media is filled with these images. And each time I see it, you know, I have this feeling that um, people are now confused. What is the real color of the Milky Way? Is there any real color, or the Milky Way is changing color every night? <laughs> because you see, in one picture, the Milky Way is blue, another one is purple, then green, then yellow. And the real color of the Milky Way may be a bit boring to some people, but that's the one. Some of the images are made for cultural purposes. This was a project for a um, group of uh, association in Brazil. And in Brazil, the Southern Cross is a very important constellation. This is the smallest constellation in the entire sky, out of 88. But one of the most notable, because there are four brightest stars in a very small area in the sky. And that's why it's on the flag of several nations in the Southern Hemisphere. It's Brazil. smaller than Sagira. It's smaller than Sagira. It is, yeah, slightly smaller than Sagira. <coughs> By record, is the smallest constellation in the sky. So some of these faint um, little constellations like Segida, the, the main stars are compact in one area, but then IAU imagined a larger area for them in the early 20th century when they measured uh, the constellations. New Zealand and Australia are the other two main nations with Southern Cross on the flag. Where is this? Germany. Germany, Neuschwanstein. Uh, the famous castle in southern Bavaria, in the Bavarian Alps, but very few people have seen it from this angle because this is a fisheye view. So even when I show this presentation in Germany, nobody realized this is Neuschwanstein. <laughs> because uh, everybody imagined this ca castle with the backdrop of the Alps uh, over a hill. This is made for a planetarium. So some of our images are made in a food dome. Um, that's um, a term we use when we create an image which covers the entire dome of a planetarium. When we have a show for planetariums, it's uh, presented live. It's not available online as a stock. We only present it live. 
another planetarium image takes us to another story, which is very relevant to this group here. We also like to document the work of astronomers, both amateur and professional astronomers, to show what this habit, hobby, and dedication means in, to science and to the person. This is my friend James uh, Lowry in West Texas. And he's using his little personal telescope. <laughs> um, the world's largest, I think, uh, at the moment, personal telescope. Uh, record was in hand of Mario, but no longer. <laughs> Maybe for quality, yes. Because <laughs> this is just the Dapsonian. So Jim is uh, doing research. A small group of amateur astronomers are contributing to front edge science. That means they discover things, supernovae, novae, they discover comets, asteroids, uh, they monitor exoplanets and variable stars. And astronomers are using their power and dedication in order to achieve better science. Not every amateur astronomer is doing that. The majority of them are more hobbies. They enjoy looking at the sky with a pair of binoculars or even just unaided eyes, casually, time to time, on a mountain trip. But some of them are more dedicated to the science side of astronomy. And I can tell you, this is not really an easy job. I was there um, with him one night, and I didn't really comfortable on top of that ladder. <laughs> <laughs> but the view was magnificent, especially in the darkest sky in West Texas. This observatory is next to McDonald's Observatory. Yeah, it was pretty good, yeah. yeah. Not as good as yours, I would say, <laughs> but I mean, it's uh, not science grade, but pretty good. What's, what's the diameter? Uh, 48 inch. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, everything is big in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I was attending the <coughs> Texas Star Party, and Jim is part of that. Uh, what a fascinating event. I highly recommend you to go there. A um, group of 300 to 400 people are coming together. Uh, good talks and uh, very good night in the sky. There is a threat from uh, the oil industry, because all around it is um, uh, excavation at the moment. So it used to be one of the darkest or the darkest place um, in the US, in mainland US, to observe the night sky, but not at the moment because of this uh, Permian oil excavation all around, and gas at the same time. So you see these halos on the horizon, it's growing. Mm -hmm. um, oil drillers just recently agreed to want to use 3,000 K and shield them off. In Texas. Oh, I read that, uh, but mm -hmm. I asked McDonald Observatory, they said that they're not following that. Yeah. Yeah. They made an agreement with McDonald's and I contacted them, but they told me it's not starting yet, but there is a signature for sure. Okay. So another recent trip in New Zealand, I was on a lecture tour and a few nights I had some occasion to test the new EOS RA Canon camera for astrophotography. But I'd like to talk to you more about the, the feeling of the stargazing at night time and astrophotography. You go to places where everybody is living. You go to a national park, and all the people are coming to their cars to go away, and you're there. You're there alone after sunset. You hear the sounds of animals, nocturnal species, and you get this feeling of connection to your past and future, connection to the earth and the sky at the same time, connecting to nature, not as a human, but as just one single element of a larger universe, because you're just standing under an ocean of the stars. So I can't really describe that with words, but it's such a unique experience that led me to this adventure for 25 years. And it has some cost, of course. You know, you, you, you do not do a typical lifestyle. You can't go to every party and family meeting. You have to skip many of them. You go to a vacation, and night the sky is clear. You have to leave your wonderful wife and go outside in freezing temperature and take pictures. And then, when they're ready to go, 
in daytime activity, you're sleeping. <laughs> you know, this has some consequences too in the sleep cycle. And I'm sure you're aware of that. Very few people maybe do that to my extent, but on average, more than 70, 80 nights of the year are not sleeping. Uh, the whole night I'm taking pictures outside. And over a long time, now my doctor tells me that I have some issues due to lack of sleep. And uh, one of the main ones is bad immune system, very bad immune system. And this is a, quite a serious issue. Mario solved that problem by building a house around himself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's why the uh, 2017 prize in, in Nobel Medicine, uh, I'm sorry, the Nobel Prize in Medicine went to the three researchers who figured out the biochemical pathway of melatonin suppression and how it affects you. So, so you confirm that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, I, the melatonin suppression is becoming my main topic of interest at the moment, <laughs> more and more. And I realize it's a bit too late, but um, I don't regret that, because the feeling and experience was very unique. Jupiter is sinking in the ocean, Milky Way, green air glow, lagoon nebula, and the center of the galaxy. This is the 51.2 made for mirrorless cameras, the new Canon 50, and it's used at wide open aperture. Not far from here, only four hours drive in Maine, amateur astronomers come together every year. Is Kelly here? Up here. Yes? Up on, up on top. Bob. Oh, yes. <laughs> so Kelly is, um, is Somewhere there, you know. <laughs> Hard to tell. This is the main astronomy retreat. I had the pleasure to contribute to this fascinating event in July or August every year in the past few years. And uh, the sky is beautiful. Uh, the crowd is very nice coming from all across the East Coast and some other areas. And this is a single exposure of 45 minutes. I used to do these with digital cameras to a sequence of images, the time lapse, and stacking them to create a longer exposure because of noise. But now with newer cameras, you can bring it down to ISO 100 or even 64 and create an image which mimics the analog um, result from the film time. And it's more appealing to the eye because the stars, the star trail is more uh, natural looking. With a digital camera and stacking, I will show you another result, and you will see there are too many stars. It's a, it's a taste of a person. But now I try more of these single exposures uh, and long <coughs> exposure. Now, Where is that in Maine? It's uh, the town of Washington. Uh, nobody has heard of it. Is that Baxter? No, nowhere no. near there. No, no. But a Washington is a very to small to town. Um, sure. Let's say half an hour west of, half an hour west of um, the, the three main touristic towns on the beach, uh, which is... Midway uh, between Camden and Augusta. Yeah, Cam oh yeah, perfect, perfectly located, yes. Is that a little bit of an aurora in the bottom? No, that's air that I was hoping to capture, this is looking north, the sky is, um, horizon is clear, so basically you can see aurora from this side. I have not seen it in the past few years in here. But it is very possible we are just passing through solar minimum. I would say in a couple of years, maybe we can see aurora from here. Because as you know, uh, the east coast of the North America is perfectly aligned with the north magnetic pole of the Earth. That's why from this longitude, we are at a very high magnetic latitude. Latitude here is only 40 to 43. But magnetic latitude is above 52, 53, so 10 degrees more. <laughs> and um, that's equivalent to somewhere around um, 60 degrees in the very east of Asia. And that makes this more frequent visibility of aurora. I have captured aurora from 10 miles west of Boston, from Waltham, in 2017.
amateur astronomers, this time not in the US, in Iran. So I'd like to include this picture because the news coming from Iran is very different from what the normal people are. So this is, these are typical stargazers from the city of Tehran going to their campsite a couple of hours drive from the capital to enjoy the night sky. And the country has probably the most active amateur astronomy society um, in the whole Middle East. Stargazer, who is also a voice actor, my friend Roger, famous voice actor working with Hollywood, is posing here in four second exposure, the backdrop of out of focus stars in Scorpion. So, amateur astronomy and astrophotography can be from many different jobs and cultures and countries. They're not necessarily from only physicists or um, astronomers and astrophysicists. We all share the same passion. It's not necessarily about our age or origin. And that was one of the reasons I started the World at Night project. In 2006, we formed the project, announced it in 2007. A couple of years later, it became the first project of International Astronomical Union. I invited a group of photographers who were the best at the time in their country. Uh, we were a group of 20 at the beginning and now 40. So every year, we're inviting a couple of new members to Tuan. And it has been a partnership with Astronomers Without Borders, which is sharing our slogan, One People, One Sky. When the moon rises over Taj Mahal in India, within a few hours, you see the same scene in Iran, a few hours later in Greece, and some hours across the Atlantic Ocean in Arizona of the US. We're looking at one window to the universe that can unite us. Under this ceiling, we're just one family. And with this message of peace and message of night sky conservation, we are trying to um, do exhibits, online presentation, books, as you see this one here. Uh, so this, each chapter of this book is revealing one of the messages of Tuan. One is one people, one sky. The other one is about the wonders of the night sky you can see with unaided eye and you can photograph it with wide field camera. The other one is about the mix of world heritage, archaeology, and astronomy. And then comes the darkest skies, the international darkest sky parks around the world. And at, the la at last is about light pollution, so the, the fragile beauty of the night sky written by our artificial light. This was made for uh, National Geographic Fine Art Galleries. Uh, it shows air glow, but very vividly colored. Uh, it's enhanced a bit by the gallery, I should mention that. Because of the print, they have enhanced the foreground more than what I edited. But the color were there. So this was not a usual air glow. The most intense air glow I have photographed in all my career. And it happened over Grand Teton on that night in July 2013. I came to this point to photograph what Ansel Adams captured 70 years ago. This, this point is actually known after him. Um, he made this very famous picture of the Snake River and the Tetons with rays of the sun during the sunset. <coughs> but when I went there, I realized in the past seven decades, the trees are much taller, so mm -hmm. you don't see the Snake River anymore. <laughs> Um, I highly recommend you to have a look at one of these galleries. The closest one is in New York City. It's in the Soho area and um, uh, lower Manhattan. And one of the nicest ones, too. But you, you will find two of them in Florida, two in Hawaii, two in California, and other places. At the moment, only in the US. Some of the exhibits are digital. This one in Aust Austria, we, we did in 2011 for about one year. Um, some in science centers, my colleague Gernot Meiser from Germany has the World at Night mobile planetarium. Um, he can sit up to 70, 80 people there. And he takes it to some of the most unusual locations, anywhere he can find the audience. <laughs> 
<laughs> so we really are trying to invite at least two new members which are female. So I'm really embarrassed that we don't have any female member in Tuan group, and, but I can guarantee we are taking care of this. <laughs> and this has been an issue in the past few years because this type of photography was not that common uh, previously for female photographers. But now we can see the change. Uh, the Tuan contest that we were doing <laughs> annually until a couple of years ago, the last two Tuan contests, the winners were females, the top winners. And you can see that on social media too. You can see it also in the attendees here too. Lovely. The ladies here are in fact from my workshops um, in Iceland and Linda has been already to four workshops. I think you, you can come and continue it instead of me. <laughs> astronomers Without Borders is doing um, connection between amateur astronomers around the world, donating telescopes and other equipment to developing countries, and a lot of interesting activities, especially during the Global Astronomy Month. Some of, some of my projects were challenging. This one was for Algeria National Observatory project for sightseeing. They were looking for the location, but also looking for PR images of the surrounding area. So I helped them with both in 2009, but the location was a bit too hot. Uh, in, in that time of the year we were visiting, this is Tassili National Park, a world heritage area in southern Algeria and deep in the Sahara at the border of Niger. And it's just one of the most unusual, bizarre places on earth. But 300 kilometers away from the first um, village, from the first light bulb, so you can imagine how dark it can be after moonset. But since it was too hot, uh, we encountered a lot of a scorpion and a snakes. <laughs> Just a bit too many. <laughs> From one desert to another one, this one is unusual as well. It's in the middle of Colorado, uh, surrounded by mountains. Great Sand Dunes National Park, right at Moonset. Border of New Hampshire and Maine, and this rural house, uh, the barn, the house is just behind me, the barn which uh, are apparently no longer there according to the owner. I posted this image on National Geographic and explained about it. Then the daughter of the owner emailed me, <laughs> the word is very small, that the barn is gone, the father is gone too. And, um, but the night sky is still there. <laughs> However, not for long, if you look at these, Lights. This is not sunset. This is reflection of a nearby town on the clouds. And as these towns are growing, if we don't control properly the light, that means shielding the light and dimming it a bit, uh, the natural heritage of the night sky will be gone very fast. And that's why we also photograph cities in order to show people what is missing in the cities. Out of thousands of people walking and driving in Champs Elysees in that evening, I would guarantee you nobody saw this conjunction of Moon and Venus because we're just simply too busy with our lifestyle. Well, at least two of them saw it the police officers who captured me <laughs> during the scene. <laughs> when you're shooting with a telephoto like this one, this is with 400 millimeter. Um, you have a very narrow angle to align yourself. If you go 10 feet away, it's no longer aligned. So you have to be exactly at the planned location. And that planned location was a slightly in the middle of the street. <laughs> <laughs> For 40 minutes. <laughs> the drivers were very cooperative. <laughs> but not the police officers. They came exactly at the best moment. You know, this was the moment I was talking to them. And the moon was just navigating through to the top of the towers. These are not the stars. These are the top of the towers in La Défense, the modern part of Paris. And I was you know, talking to them in English, and they were responding in French. 
uh, about my passion and interest in the United Sky World, believe it or not, it worked. Because every person on this planet has some relation to night sky, especially from the childhood, they remember the stars and the night sky, and uh, they can understand you. It didn't work in few countries. You know, I've been captured in many countries. <laughs> Most places it worked. You know, one of the places it didn't work, um, one occasion was Algeria, because I was shooting a military station I didn't mm -hmm. see in my pictures. <laughs> it was on the horizon. Four elements I like to combine in these photos. Art and technique is very obvious, but moment like this, and then the story. I think the story is very often missing in astrophotography because we care about the science, the technique, but it's very important to include story in astrophotography as well. The most important story we can cover is the importance of night to sky to preserve, is the light pollution, and the natural night to sky values. Here in Boston, the crescent moon is setting from Boston Harbor. And I'm far, a couple of miles away, shooting with a very long telephoto lens. You can see the atmospheric refraction happening on the moon, blurring the details of our cosmic neighbor activities in the room and you wonder how many of these people in the apartments and offices are aware of the celestial wonder happening behind them. Probably zero, because that's our city lifestyle. In fact, they were busy with other things. I usually stop it right here, sorry about that, because there are some private things happening in the upper room. <laughs> Just to protect the people privacy. When, when the screen is large, I skip that. When the screen is small, I Can we verify that? <laughs> yeah, first uh, I was doing a lecture in a very big hall. The screen was like five times, and I realized people are laughing. I didn't, I was not seeing that picture on such a large screen before. <laughs> and after that, I'm skipping this part. <laughs> so, but by the way, if you're living in one of these high towers, um, just be careful, you know, this nasty astrophotographer <laughs> <goes hard. laughs> They shoot the night sky and your privacy, the long telephoto lens. They should use curtains. Yeah, yeah, best way. I miss the sky. Another part of the message of Tuan, as I said, is the combination with culture and archaeology, the word heritage. Because when you look at these monuments from hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, and the stars are also showing us images and light from hundreds and thousands of years ago. So this is very similar. And this combining these two contexts together is very appealing uh, in the story. And it's a bridge between art, culture, humanity, and science. But access to these world heritage sites is difficult. They're protected, so you need the permission. They're illuminated, like this one. So you need a curtain on the light, <laughs> at least briefly, which I have tried a few times. And sometimes you need to jump over the walls. Getting to UNESCO, World Heritage Sites it needs a long-term um, co cooperation and communication in order to get access, because at night time it becomes more difficult. Some of them are openly accessible. This is Lake Tecapo. It's not uh, directly a World Heritage Site. It's under the Night to Sky Heritage by UNESCO Initiative. It's a new initiative by UNESCO to include the night sky of some of the areas in the world in combination of their natural or cultural importance. So it's a kind of new UNESCO World Heritage. And this is one of the places. Lake Tekapo in New Zealand. International Dark Sky Reserve with very good night sky and this famous chapel of the Good Shepherd. An astrophotography camera is used here for the 10-second exposure revealing Carina Nebula. This nebula 
is even larger than Orion or Lagoon, <coughs> which is visible in the Northern Hemisphere. But we can't see it from this latitude. 10 seconds. 10 seconds. 10 seconds at 1.2 ISO 6400. And that's Southern Cross on the right side. And that was the Canon? Canon EOS RA. But you know, the photographer the main part. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, when you use an astrophotography camera, then you can reveal in 10 seconds some of these um, nebulosity pretty easily when you're shooting with a fast lens. It depresses that? Yes, enhance it a bit, but not much. <laughs> you know, it's not that different from the first look to the camera screen, but I have enhanced the Milky Way. During twilight, a picture by my colleague, Tuan member Oshin Zakarian, is showing a very massive ziggurat, a kind of, kind of a pyramid in Middle East you know, from Mesopotamia. This is in southwest Iran. This ziggurat is back from about 3,200 years ago. And it's the world's largest of its kind. So we can imagine that the ancient astronomers were using their observation from the top of these temples in order to keep the time, keep calendar for ritual and agricultural purposes. And it was not only the Middle East, the same thing in Egypt, and the same thing here in Central America, in Guatemala, for example, or Mexico, <coughs> Belize, where these massive pyramids by Maya culture is remained, especially this one, we have very strong evidence that the site of Tikal in northern Guatemala was used by astronomers of the time, or we can call, call them timekeepers. We're not sure exactly if they, if they can define them within astronomy, but definitely they were very avid stargazers, beyond only looking at Venus or Moon, looking at, looking at many things, especially Pleiades. In this picture, a close-up look over here would show you um, the Pleiades rising. I have used a diffuser filter in front of the lens to, uh, during the exposure to enhance the color of the stars. That's why you see vividly blue of Pleiades here, um, home to many young stars. And this is an old star, orange Aldebaran, in constellation towers. So from top of these temples, they were using Pleiades and other stars and planets in the night sky to keep track of time. More of them could be related to astronomy, but the evidence is very diffuse, like these hinges in uh, Europe. This one in Portugal, it's called Chromalek, even older than a Stonehenge. Some signs on petroglyph are even related to the night sky. This one is one of my favorite because this um, one single rock has over 150 pictures from different eras. Some are from newer era when people were writing. That means 6,000 years ago. That was the beginning of writing in Iran and Middle East and in the world. And some were very old. This is an Ice Age animal no longer exists in the Middle East after the Ice Age. So this means the picture is minimum 17,000 years ago, that one, uh, with a very unusual hunting tool from that time. Same area, a kilometer away, another panel of petroglyph showing the uh, Asiatic cheetah, only 100 of them left in Iran and in the world, unfortunately big, in a big danger of extinction at the moment. Wolf, um, probably leopard, snow falling, hunters are coming, but there's a live animal here. Anybody can find it? Here? No? It's on the left. Let me give you a closer look. Can you see it? Can you see this guy here? <laughs> closer look? So probably wolf or fox, um, curious by uh, my shutter activation. So nowadays I use a um, silent shutter. It, it creates no noise. <laughs> With a big DSLR camera, the shutter is really noisy. And 
it was either curious or very angry, <laughs> this noise. And there, for only a fraction of the exposure, uh, the exposure was 10, 15 seconds, so probably was just standing there for five, six seconds. And I realized the presence of this animal five years after I took this. Yes. <laughs> Night sky, a natural night environment is very fragile. This beautiful lake near Washington, Maine, uh, we rented this boathouse uh, for my family, and uh, the first night they couldn't sleep because of a sound, an unusual sound, which you will hear. And it's very common in North America, but most people have disconnected from these kind of natural experiences. You turn, up, turn on a couple of these nice white blue LEDs on this light, and all these birds are gone because they need natural night environment. They're very, very sensitive, especially to white blue lights, like human as well. called loons, the diver birds. And not only in North America, across Europe, they are very common too. But as I said, nocturnal species are very sensitive to artificial light. At the moment, this lake is protected. There is no artificial light because most of the honors understand the night sky. And it's also the place for the main astronomy retreat. So stargazing is very common here. But as I said, it happens very easily on one of these many lakes of Maine, somebody buy a house, a vacation house. They go there a couple of times per year, but they leave this white blue LED light on the front door for the whole year, every night, just for the sake of safety. They feel safer by doing that. And it changed the whole environment. We are not aware of how much damage we do with just one single bulb of light in nature. And this is an old Persian saying I like to use. It's been used in the book as well. And it's so true because when you're under the night of sky, you see that there is a whole universe that you can share with public. It's like going to an unseen cave and share the experience with people because most people have not seen this night of sky in their life. There are generations of people now who have not seen the Milky Way at all. So that's why when we post some of these images or do exhibits, we hear frequently, are these photoshops? Is the Milky Way really visible like that? Or is it the Milky Way? And you have probably heard of the story that people seen the Milky Way during major blackouts in the cities, like in Los Angeles uh, some years ago, and reported this as kind of a strange cloud in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> Kilimanjaro, complete moonless dark night. But thanks to long exposure and air glow activity, um, the, the foreground is slightly illuminated. Large and small Magellanic clouds. And I was with a guide from a local tribe. He was known for recognizing animals at night for safety, and also I was trying to shoot a uh, giraffe at night against Kilimanjaro. And he was amazing. He was just pointing to every animal. I couldn't see any of them. But, uh, and he told me that how much difference is vision from one person to the other. 
hopefully he can recognize any lions. Because this is within a national park, Ambasili National Park, uh, home to many lions. Mount Damavant in Iran. Um, this used to be magma, so it's cut through the magma because of road. It's illuminated by cars passing by during the exposure. But the layer of um, past magma is visible now. The rest of the image is illuminated by the moon. High Sierras in California in November. Moonlight in Grand Canyon, but the story, of course, Grand Canyon is majestic, but the story in this picture is <coughs> up here. Do you see this light dome? Mm. This is about 70 miles away, 100 kilometers, and it's not a city. It's a power station next to the town of Page. So it's brighter than the town of Page. Northern Arizona, the last remaining coal-fired power station in the area, or well, probably in the U.S., I'm not 100% sure. Closed two weeks ago. Yeah, closed. Oh, yes, really? Wow. Oh, the light is gone. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to retake the picture. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I was really surprised uh, because the intensity of light, you can tell from illuminated cloud, was really high. And I didn't find any reasonable uh, logic behind it, you know. For is airplanes, even fraction of this light is visible for any airplane to see that. Is that next to Antelope Canyon? Yes, next to Antelope, exactly. So much still along the call. Yes. And of course, none of them were shielded. We use light for many purposes. And some of them are highly respected, of course, like art use light for art festivals. There are light festivals around the world. This one is very famous near uh, Lisbon, Portugal, in the town of Cascais in September. Fascinating to visit. We use light for safety and security. We use light for identity. That's one of the problems. The small villages and towns like to, like to brighten up because that creates a bigger identity. And I have seen that around the world. We use light for commercial purposes, and that's another problem they're facing. So light is not only for safety and security. And when we address light pollution, we have to consider these as well. We use light for identity. The city of Prague, without these lights, you know, will have much fewer tourists because that's one of the beauties of Prague walking at night and illumination. But by smartly illuminating this, and we have the technology now, we can reduce the fraction of light which is going to the sky. And when the tourists are gone after midnight, why do we still illuminate them at 3 in the morning? In France, they don't do that. Most of the country in France, the landmarks are switched off after 12 or 1 in the morning. Some at 11 in the western part of the country, like in Britain. Most of the villages are switched off. Normandy in Brittany at 11. And why we don't do that in the US? I think it's a great idea because you, you go to places where nobody is in the village, in the streets, in the town, and heavily illuminated the whole night. Moon is setting behind this dusty but colorful evening of Tehran. I posted this image in relation to the recent protests in Iran and uh, because there were thousands of people on the street protesting against, first it was the gas price increase, but then it was more about the freedom. And it became a bit wild and uh, brutal reaction from the government. But the image went out of my control because some people use it as a symbol of freedom, you know, with the bird flying and the moon and this massive uh, tower against that. So it was symbol of everything in the image. Uh, so hopefully in two days I'm going to Iran, nothing happens. <laughs> so I'm with my family, I'm flying to uh, Iran uh, later this week for a family visit. 
So I'm very curious to know what happens at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, well, I'm not an activist, and uh, my intention was to reflect on what was happening. I have a large social media platform, and I would like to share the message with the board because the Iranian government um, shut down the, the internet. And that was not really good I mean, uh, in the 21st century. You don't do that all of a sudden. And they had their own internet, you know, privately. All the leaders were using internet, but not the regular people. Especially for a country where it's one of the most active on internet um, per population. And a sequence of 400 images taken that evening is creating a moon trail. From here, we are shifting towards, as we approach the end of the talk, uh, astronomical phenomena visible to uh, astrophotographer. And that's one of the chapters in the book, too. My favorite chapter in the book, in fact, which I invested a lot of time in the text of it and the stories. Aurora photography is not technically difficult. It's bright, um, it's easy to see and easy to capture, but it's very difficult to have a natural looking image. Some people go to a very faint activity aurora and uh, just enhance it in the pose and reveal it or share it as a storm level or activity. But when you look at it, you can instantly tell this has been saturated in the post-processing. The second cha challenge is that how to control your sensation and feeling. Because when it gets really active, you start to cry, you make uh, some unusual noises. And, <laughs> and when you're in a group, you hear, you hear that. But when, once you can control yourself, technically it's easy. This was 2 in the morning in March 2015, the most intense geomagnetic activity in the past 15 years. It was KP9, and that means at KP9, you, you see it from here easily as well. I mean, outside of light pollution, for example, from Cape Cod or West Massachusetts, Maine. In Maine, KP9, almost reaches overhead in northern Maine. So you, you can basically expect a crown in northern Maine uh, at KP9. Appeared on the cover of National Geographic Special Edition. It's a close-up of the same image. The blue light of aurora is very, very rare to photograph or to see. Another very active aurora now in Lapland, Sweden, from Iceland to another aurora destination. Finland, Sweden, and Norway are also very commonly used for aurora chasing, Alaska and Canada as well. A couple of my friends in Iceland who are my partners of the um, workshop, the photo tour I'm doing in Iceland every six months, and they hate aurora. Mm -hmm. The reason is that they're deep sky photographers. <laughs> For a deep sky photographer, aurora is light pollution. So they have this um, calculation of aurora activity. They go outside when it's zero. <laughs> if it's one or two, they stay indoors. <laughs> but when we have the tour, they're always with us, and of course, uh, they try to show some feeling. <laughs> And you can understand them, you know, it's so dominating. There is no empty sky for deep sky photographers. <laughs> they had a great time in the past three months. There was no aurora activity. <laughs> <laughs> Solar eclipses, last one was in Chile, Argentina. The next total eclipse is also in Chile and Argentina, December 22. Um, and I hope. Or some of you 14, plan to 14, go. 14, 14. 14. December 14, 22. Uh, 2020. <laughs> so it's uh, just exactly one year from now. It's a bit further south. Um, the previous eclipse was 
passing over the southern part of Atacama Desert, like the city of La Serena and some of the observatories. This is further south, but in much better season. So the weather prospect is better. Otherwise, that area in winter could be really cloudy. It's in the famous lakes area of Chile. And uh, weather in Argentina is even slightly better in some areas. This was in Indonesia, 2016, over um, a group of islands near Ternate. A close-up of a total solar eclipse, a composite of seven images. Atmospheric phenomena, although they're very brief and sometimes not that notable, they're quite eye-catching to an astrophotographer. Halo around the moon or a lightning. My second camera was shooting, this is a single exposure. And so to, to today, it surprised me, the dynamic range. My second camera was shooting a telephoto capturing this supercell because every minute there was one lightning. And the same moment was revealed in much larger um, detail. And that's another image I contribute to the Nat Geo galleries. Above a lightning, when it's really massive storm clouds, and you are far enough from it with clear sky above it, you may expect to see this rarely captured phenomenon known as red sprites, or just briefly sprites. Sprites are happening midway to space, about 50 to 60 miles, uh, 40 to 50 miles above us. It's in relation to the lightning, but it has a different mechanism. Some of them are quite brief, uh, just tenth of a second. Some last up to quarter or even half a second, but none of them are colorful to the eyes. That's why most people have not seen them. Uh, they're faint, they're completely colorless, but you see this little patch of light coming for a fraction of a second, 10 degrees above the lightning, and disappear. It's very mysterious. And until mid-1980s, nobody believed the observers, <coughs> pilots, and marine navigators, they were reporting this. Nobody believed that in the science community until it was <coughs> discovered um, in a science research in mid-1980s. And then, all the studies are started by NASA and different funds, and we have some good knowledge about it today. And this was my best result of a sprite so far. It's a close-up in West Texas. Um, funny enough, I, I arrived here uh, for the Texas, uh, Texas Star Party. That night, it was a stormy on the horizon. Everybody were in, in the tents, sleeping. I asked around, you know, why people are not outside looking because the sky is so clean and clear there when it's just a little bit cloudy nobody um, continue they keep the energy for the next night the so spot underneath those is that the thunderstorm uh, yeah this this is a thunderstorm yes this is uh, a, a town a little town here next to the Texas Star Party location Fort Davis the thunderstorm is this light uh, covered it's by the dark by area. Dark. And, and, and oh, and this. No, this yeah. is a cloud. This okay. is a cloud. Okay. And these green things. Uh, oh, you don't see them. Probably you see it over on the screen. They're air glow. So active thunderstorm create air glow. You will see it in the video. I will show you. So here comes the video. It's a time lapse video. Uh, freezing on the moment of um, sprites. And these are air glow. You see the waves are coming. It's called the atmospheric uh, gravity waves, different from the physical gravitational waves. And these atmospheric gravity waves are generated by several reasons. Uh, one could be major lightnings, storms. I'm impressed. Oh. Yeah, so I think it's visible from these areas, but it's more commonly visible from lower latitudes, of course, because they have more storms, massive storms in the tropics, the best area to capture that. But uh, my colleague in France at similar latitude, he captured it all the time, and he has the world's best images of British Pride, Stefan Wetter. 
Well, it has to recharge the electric field, so it's got to go pretty pretty high, well above the top of the thunderstorm. Yes, yes. So uh, the <coughs> altitude of it is about average of 50 to 60 kilometers. Uh, and if you're about 100 miles away, it would be about 10 degrees above the thunderstorm. If you're closer, it will be higher, 20 degrees, 25. Uh, so the best distance I would recommend is about 100, 150 miles away from the thunderstorm. So anyhow, the next day, I show it in my lecture um, that while you were sleeping, I captured that. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the phenomena are puzzling to astrophotographers and stargazers. This was a halo I captured in 2007 in Iran, and then later on I realized um, it was uh, a rocket activity, <laughs> extra fuel left inside the rocket and ejected outside because the second stage of the rocket didn't work well, so it was a failure. Then it has a story, we don't have time for it, it, it has a funny story. But anyhow, I, I combined other photographers' results of similar events over the years. and. They're not that rare. They happen time to time when one of these rockets uh, make a, an exotic activity like this one. was another failed mission from Russia this time. And it was seen by many villagers in northern Laplands and reported as UFO, of course. Most like um, illustration of wormhole. <laughs> This could be easily recognized as a biological image. <laughs> <laughs> fireballs and bright meteors. Most of these fireballs are missed by an astrophotographer because by, um, by rule, it happens 180 degrees away from you. Of course. Yeah. So you shoot this way, it's always <laughs> That happens, continue shooting after the fireball is gone. This was in northern Maine. And I continued, I didn't manage to capture the fireball, but the persistent meteor train, the ionized gas in our atmosphere, is expanding by the high winds. And the last shot is 45 minutes after the meteor is gone. Some meteors are bizarre. And there is a discussion at the moment. I have sh I'm collecting these images, and I highly recommend you, if you have captured any of these, please communicate with me. Meteors showing zigzag motion. I've seen that, and yes. I have no explanation for that. Uh, I have captured one across my field, and it wiggled, and I couldn't say, I mean, the stars were still, so I have no idea why it did that. Did you else mention that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I I appreciate if you can um, send me the samples because I have about a dozen of them, uh, but we need more people to because I have been in um, discussion with astronomers and there's no model at the moment to explain this because you know this little wiggle is about 100 to 200 meters. You know, the the object is coming down; it's not going to go 100, 200 meters across the atmosphere like this. If it were an area where there was substantial shear, that's exactly the structure you would get out of it. You always get a wave structure when you have strong shear. And I would bet that that was an area where there was strong shear. Even for a small, um, fast moving object. Uh, that doesn't explain the circularity, itself. Fred. What? Does not explain the circular motion. Well, if you have some kind of a jet going spinning, what's the circular motion? It's corkscrewing through the atmosphere. Well, it's all, you get, all you're getting is a wavy structure out of it. Yeah, it's the winds. The so maybe atmosphere is moving at different speeds. No, but all you can see in the picture is a wavy structure. You can almost invariably see, when you see clouds, there's a decent shear. They'll always look wavy. Why do the oceans have waves in it? Because it's shear. Every fluid in the shear will give you waves. But this um, is I'm not saying that that's the time. reason, but every shear zone in a fluid will give you a wavy structure. Mm -hmm. 
So another explanation some astronomers suggest is that it's the shape inside the camera. And I was suspicious of that too. If, mm -hmm. the, if the mirror is going up and you have not used the mirror lock over a mirrorless camera. No, because the stars are in a single place. You don't see that uh, shaking. You only see uh, the main area where the star is uh, more visible during that exposure. <laughs> For example, in a 10 second exposure, the star is mainly there. Yeah, that but you're catching it just as the mirror is moving. Yes. Yeah, you don't buy that because then you wouldn't have the light in the. Uh, yeah, because, the well, they're rare, but the problem is that I have captured with a mirrorless camera too. <laughs> <laughs> so another explanation was the shaking tripod. And you know, you have seen my tripod. They, they call it the tree. This tripod is impossible to shake. <laughs> So, yeah, I'm not exactly sure, and I'm happy to hear that others um, yeah. And I have found oh, some historic reports about yeah, it from the 19th century and so on, that people have vi visually seen uh, meteors, a zigzag. Meteors are related to comets, and this was the very important image in my career, because that was the first assignment I did, and I sold an image for a cover of a magazine in 97. So basically that has started my professional photography, Comet Hellbop. Hellbop yeah. And I'm sure many people in this room have seen it. It was the last great comet perfectly visible in the northern hemisphere. Then we had 2007 Comet Magnot in the southern hemisphere. And every decade, we have, on average, one great comet. That means bright enough to be visible even from cities. But over the past 12 years, we had no great comet. So it's quite due, and I really hope to see another one. Because this is the most fantastic celestial phenomenon you can expect. Uh, we had a taxi driver that night taking us to these mountains near Tehran, and he was afraid of dark. As we were going up, he was nagging the whole time. Why are we going at night at dark and this is not safe? Until in midway, the valley opened for a moment and he saw the comet in front of the car. He left the wheel and started to scream. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole night he was asking me, so what size of this, how far is this? And believe it or not, he became a subscriber to our astronomy magazine. <laughs> Usual comments are like this. So these are usual news-making comments. They become bright enough to be visible with unaided eye, but not massively interesting. And then we come from the Parkes Radio Telescope in the previous picture to observatories. We go to observatories to document their nighttime environment. This is the world's highest observatory, ALMA Radio Telescope. 66 dishes working together. They are combined into one telescope. And in the south hemisphere, in the southern hemisphere, there is no polaris. That's why you don't see any bright star here. It's almost empty. And that's quite a pain when you want to um, track your stars with a mount. We have to find the South Celestial Pole in order to use a tracker. Uh, in Northern Hemisphere, Polaris is really great help. And this is a good example of a digitally stacked star trip. That's why there's so many stars in this picture. It's not a single exposure. It's 30, 60 images of 30 seconds, or 20 seconds. I've been to many of these observatories, and some has their own stories. Like Mauna Kea has a story which is different from any other. Um, it's a struggle between the locals and scientists, some locals, who believe there should not be any new building on their sacred land. This is the most sacred mountain to local Hawaiians. And Mauna Kea became a struggle in the past five decades, but especially news making in the past one year, because the road is closed by these group of locals. For one month, astronomers didn't manage to go up to the observatory. You know, every second of these telescopes is immensely valuable for, uh, it has a money count, but it's also immensely valuable for science production. 
and one month is a huge amount of time. Now they're, they're using an off-road going to the top. Still, the main road is not accessible. Because of a new telescope called TMT, the 30-meter telescope, and this telescope is big, so it has a considerably large area, and the construction has started, so the mountain has changed, but the locals are trying to show their power that this is their land. The decision needs to be made by them, and the project has stopped. They're looking for another alternative, and probably would be Canary Islands. This is the view they like to see, a mountain untouched, a sacred mountain without any building. But at the same time, the local Hawaiians is a culture very much in relation to astronomy. The way they reach to Hawaii by navigation by stars. So it's a contradiction at the same time because they respect astronomy too, but they have a sacred mountain. And not every Hawaiian is supporting that. So both, both sides has their own rights. It's hard to judge. This is Mauna Kea at sunrise. The shadow of Mauna Kea is casting over um, the, the island and into the ocean. And this is probably the home to the 30-meter telescope, La Palma, Canary Islands, already home to an 11-meter giant telescope called GTC. And that's the place of my annual master class called AstroMaster. I go there every year in May because it gives us opportunity of fantastic nature and amazing night of sky. One of the telescopes on top. Some of the major telescopes in the world are now retired. Uh, and Mount Wilson is one of them. Mount Wilson is still doing science by the Chara Ray. But the large telescope there, the 100 inch, the famous telescope used by Edwin Hubble to discover the expansion of the universe, is now available to rent to amateur astronomers. How much? 2,500 per night. There. Yes? <laughs> Oh, yes. So you can rent mm -hmm. the 60 inch for uh, 1950 and this one for 2500 per night. So usually a group of 10, 15 people, amateur astronomers, come there. But other people too. Some people do star um, birthday parties. So it gives a, a birthday gift to somebody, you know, a group gift. I have heard that a couple of people proposed under the telescope, which could be a great idea, I would say. And uh, some, sometimes private events. So I was there during a private event. Uh, this teenager is observing um, Orion Nebula in a moonlight night and through the 100-inch telescope. There was no connector uh, to the eyepiece. So I handheld my camera behind the eyepiece for a fraction of a second, quarter of one second, handheld. This is the view. <laughs> And you see the colors. So this is the aperture that you can clearly see the colors of the nebulosity. Even with the 60 inch, it's very similar. I would personally prefer the 60 inch because it's easier to handle. You see more objects during the night. <coughs> I saw spokes on Saturn's ring from Arizona. Well, with the 60 or? So I sent an email to America and said I found it. Who was the operator? I was invited in for a group. No, oh, so I was there for another meeting and they invited me in. It was unbelievable. Right? Yeah. So, last uh, few slides, our story to wrap it up is about light pollution. This is not definitely not sunrise. That's Las Vegas. From 100 miles away, 90 point something, so that's 150 kilometers. You can imagine from 100 miles away, this is still so bright because the city is rather condensed and of course very bright. And that's the identity of the city you cannot easily touch. But more surprising is on the right side. And this is 210 miles away, the greater Los Angeles area. 210 miles. 
you can see one is more yellow, the other one is more white. It's related to the distance and refraction too, but of course there are much more LED lights in Las Vegas. It was a story I did for National Geographic, and um, we, we go inside Las Vegas and Los Angeles, and we get go out to the furthest distance, so these are visible in Death Valley National Park, which is the darkest sky preserved area. And we still see them as a light dome on the horizon. So as we move in towards Las Vegas, about 20 miles, you start to see this massive ray go into the sky every night in the past 30 years. Uh, 25 something. So what is it? Some of these lights are for a purpose. For example, in some cities in the US, they do that when a football team wins. In some places, uh, they do it as a national celebration, like we have one in Reykjavik, Iceland. Every country has some of these lights. In New York City, at 9-11, for two nights, these lights are coming out. Uh, but it's only two nights, and it has even a lot of ecological problems, because it's during the migration season. So they're monitoring the amount of birds captured by these lights. But this one, every night, from a hotel and casino, it's called Luxor. And now it's an identity of the city too. It apparently shows the spirit of ancient Egyptians going to the sky from inside the casino. <laughs> With their winnings. It's like a pyramid scheme. <laughs> So I went closer and closer until the guards guided me outside. <laughs> they asked me for a special permission. As soon as I mentioned National Geographic, they said, please go outside. <laughs> because they know, they know what is happening. They exactly know because there were people negotiated with them about this light. And they, they can see the birds and bats. You know, there are not one or two, there are thousands of them. They, they have their own uh, ecosystem. What the tourists don't know is every morning, they have a crew to sweep up all the dead birds. And then every night, there's about 40 to 50 dead birds at the bottom. Look so. But yeah, wow. because of that light. It's, it's atrocious. The uh, uh, oh, okay. uh, ecological science of trying to get them to show up. So I posted this on several platforms. On social media, National Geographic has 100 27 million followers, but I receive a lot of negative feedbacks too. Because as I said, light is sometimes part of identity. And yeah, these are the bats, but there are also migrating birds, and Las Vegas is not the only place. This is Sydney Opera House, a very good image by my colleague Ajay Talwar from India. This long exposure shows um, the birds captured by the lights of the Opera House. Look at this close-up, it's just crazy, the amount of birds, and they should not be active at this time of the night. This is midnight, and some of these easily are migrating birds. Because when the migrating birds are passing over a city, they're using stars and landmarks for navigation. This bright light coming out, especially the rays going to the sky, is completely confusing their system. So they go down, some of them die the first night, some die the next few days by being just simply lost in the city or smashing into the skyscraper. The story started in the 1980s and 90s in the cities of Toronto and Chicago. These two are along one of the main migrating paths. And nobody knew why these birds are dying off the, uh, the towers. Every day people were looking at four to 5,000 of dead birds from one tower. And it took us a while to realize this is light pollution, which is responsible for attracting these birds to the cities. So this was a story you can easily Google um, at geo light pollution, or go to my website, bobaktapreshi.com slash media. You will find a link to it. It's quite extensive by my colleague, Nadia Drake. And I, I proposing this for the magazine as well. Uh, at the moment was web. But the main part of the problem 
It's a new phase of light pollution, and that's the white blue LEDs. Look at here, Beijing Olympic Park. Everything has changed to white blue LEDs of 5,000 Kelvin. Tokyo completely changed to white blue. Seoul, about a year and a half ago, 5,000 Kelvin. Most of India, 5,000. And I have seen this in Central America traveling too. So the knowledge that we are sharing is just a bit slow. We have to reach more people. And of course, the world is thankful to American Medical Association, especially Mario, who was in charge of this, because we can use this as a sign, as a very good document. It was officially released in 2016 that white blue LEDs are harmful to human body. That's very important. Nobody cares about astronomy, you know. If you say white blue LEDs are scattering more light, we have more light pollution, we can't see the stars, who cares? You know, of course, amateur astronomers, astronomers care. But how many of us are there? About a million in the world, roughly. And 10,000 astronomers, professional. So the massive number of population care when it's about the quality of life. And this is what matters. White blue LEDs are affecting the quality of life by changing our sleep cycle, um, by, by affecting our psychology, and also long-term effects on environment. People care about birds. People care about white animals who are dying or changing. Bees disappearing and light pollution could be one of the reasons. This is a village in Thailand, a picture by my colleague Jeff Dai from China. And he repeatedly went to this touristic village, used to be a stargazing destination. In his next trip, he was surprised to see this. The whole village is changed to white blue LEDs. Nobody is walking in this village at midnight. But the whole night is illuminated by 5,000 Kelvin LEDs. There was a recent conference I attended in New Zealand, Lake Tikapu, on darkest skies and light pollution. And there was one claim, I would say, because not enough data, that the number of suicides in the cities of New Zealand has increased after the change to white blue LEDs. So this, these are really serious matters. We are definitely talking about quality of life. 5,000 K is 100 times more suppressive melatonin in 2007. 100 times. 100 times. So my story, of course, I've been always involved with dark sky protection, but my story intensified. I'm in a condo association. When our condo manager all of a sudden decided to change our yellow sodium lights to white blue LEDs, to 5,000 Kelvin, and one of them <coughs> is uh, sitting just next to my bedroom. So I was away on a dark sky project. I came back home, <laughs> and next to my bedroom there was 5,000 Kelvin LED. So you can imagine how much I got crazy. And <laughs> soon after I started this project, for three weeks I was fighting with my neighbors. They couldn't understand what I'm talking about. First, I started to one week, I was explaining the word light pollution because nobody had heard about that before. The second week, I started with AMA uh, documents that this is affecting the human life. Then there comes the response. Well, of course, we see more things in white blue. It's more clear. We see more colors. It's safer. And it's more energy efficient. And I contacted Mario and Kelly in order to get more data and document to share with them. And that was the beginning of the story I did for National Geographic. And I will do this fight to much further extent now, because I realize most people are completely unaware of the issue. This beautiful village is a Maya village in Lake Atitlan, Guatemala, one of the most beautiful lakes in the world, I would say. But in the past few years, the view has changed because they're changing the intensity of their light. And you have not seen the main picture. The main picture 
Uh, well, this is before I switch to that. This is the conjunction of Jupiter and Venus. Uh, that's the zodiacal light, this faint light going to the left. And the main picture is here. It's completely overexposed my image, of course. There was no way to handle that light. There are all white blue LEDs up on that village. When the light comes, electricity comes to Africa. Some of the countries in Central Africa and the villages with no electricity, what would be their first option, you think so? What is the cheapest option they're going to use? The 5,000 pieces would come from them. Yes. Okay. What happened was the US was going to go to 5,000. They may report came out. All the cities started rejecting them. The companies took the 5,000 and basically Dump them in export or any place else that would, that would take them. So, in a way, we're kind of responsible for that. Yeah, and when they invested on that, it's going to be there at least for 10, 15 years. So, these are major problems in developing countries, and we have to share this information in all the platforms we have. Uh, in fact, when AMA uh, announced the 3000 Kelvin, I would say at the time, 3,000 Kelvin was the only option available. Now we should more focus on lower Kelvin temperatures because there are possibility of going to 2,200 uh, amber LEDs. When that is available, why not? You know, 3,000 still has 20% of blue light. And if you're going to buy one for your house, especially bedroom and bathroom, in the middle of the night you're going to bathroom, you turn on this massive light and you can go back to sleep. So use a dimmer 2200 um, yellow, soft yellow light. And the number of Kelvin is clearly written on the packaging. So look for 1800, 2200, 2700. I would go below 3000. They were available when we Yes. When was that picture taken? Uh, two weeks ago. I was there just after that. Hurricane in the mudslide, and there's no light. No light, yeah. It's changing very fast. Look at this picture a comparison of 20 years in Europe and North Africa. So, definitely, we need more activity in night sky protection. We need light, that's for sure. For modern civilization, we need light at night. We just need it smartly used. The first person who can see these things is an astronaut aboard the space station, a good friend of mine, Don Pettit, who has been on the space a few times. He's also an astrophotographer, has done fascinating images from the space. And one of the images did by the crew from the space station is always in my talk because it shows a land uh, similar to an island in a way, but this is a country. You don't see the rest of the country because they switch off the light few hours after sunset. It's a mandatory. It's a big uh, non-democracy called North Korea. But compared to two capital, you know, it, the amount of economy is also showing amount of light. The heavily illuminated border, and I usually refer to it as a paradise for astrophotographers with one-way ticket. <laughs> <laughs> so I just added this uh, before I moved to, to here, before I got taxi to here. I managed to finish this. It was for a National Geographic proposal, so nobody has seen it before. It's a short video, rough cut, of. Um, volcanic activities in Guatemala, and very, some of them very close uh, to the volcanoes. This is Pacaya, and I'm quite close to the volcano on this occasion. And this is Fuego. Look how much activity it is. You know, each one of them is about 10 minutes apart. It's a time lapse. Of course, tropical storm. No Sprite on this night.
the green is from the villages. They're still using um, some fluorescent lights, dominated by fluorescent light in some of the areas. Mercury vapor. Mercury vapor, yes, yep. yes. That's Fuego? That's Fuego, yes. Now we're zooming in to Pacaya. This place is going to be a dark sky area. So I'm working with the landowner um, in order to promote their area to become IDA dark sky site. If they survive. You know. <laughs> <laughs> now it's pretty safe. Pacaya, Pacaya is not like quick. The, there are very little uh, eruption coming out. I can't. Yes? It wasn't active. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I should climb down that and get stuff all this. <laughs> wow. But I think some people die over this. In Pacaya? Yeah. Tourists. So that's a book. It's also available in French, German, and Japanese. You can find more information there. Just Google it on Amazon with bars and Google. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Sorry it took longer than expected. while we're even holding the business meeting. There'll be light refreshments after that. It's a coffee for people that are tired and need to dry. So thank you all. Uh, I didn't get to say hello to all the non-members, and we have excellent speakers every month, so you're welcome. It's great to have someone like Bob Eck that brings uh, people in, but we, we have some amazing speakers, so you're more than welcome at any time. Yeah, Tom, I have a book for Atma, and I have already signed it. Yes. So thank you. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll bring this to the clubhouse at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Great observing committee report. Can you hear me in the back? No. I think I'll no. blow up. You can't hear me? No. <laughs> uh, I gotta get my notes ready, so just read the quote for the month while I'm horrified. What's wrong? The people in the back can't see that. Mario, could you read that too? No. <laughs> for those of you who don't know, Mario is our resident astro imager. He's well known. He hates the moon, cannot stand the moon. So we're trying to kind of convince them that the, the moon's worth a look. And uh, in fact, how many of you saw the moon tonight coming in? Beautiful sight. This girl thinks it was beautiful. This is my granddaughter, Julia, seven years old. And the poor little girl is deathly afraid because she had heard there's a man from a village called Gloucester who hates the moon. <laughs> he, wants, he wants to nuke the moon, destroy it. <laughs> By the way, she takes, like, she takes like her grandfather. She's losing her teeth, too. But anyway, I made up a little song for her, just to keep her happy. And I'm going to dedicate this song to Mario. <laughs> I told you we are going to have fun tonight. Uh, Fred's not here anymore, although he'd make a motion to band all singing at that mob beating, but he's not here now. It's called Happy Little Moon. Happy little moon way up high, <laughs> brightening up the earth and the sky. Grouches will berate you, despise, abhor, and hate you. But you're still number one in my eyes, there'll be no nukes. You're still number one in my eyes. Okay. 
Okay, now let's go to serious business here. What's going on this month? And for some of you that are getting books signed and not members of the club, these things might be of interest to you. We always talk about what's going on the night sky in the month ahead, and a lot of these are naked eye things, so was that Saturday, December 14th, two nights from now. In the early morning, you see the dreaded meteor at their peak activity. Unfortunately, the moon does apologize. It'd be a moon that's just passed. <laughs> Two days past full, but these are bright meteors, so you might still be able to see some. But it's an early morning event. You'd have to get up probably after midnight. Look again in the eastern sky toward uh, uh, toward Gemini and around the star cast cast. You'll see those. December 21st, the solstice, first day of winter. Day start getting longer again. Everybody, else, yeah, everybody's happy. Non-astronomers love that. But if you're an astronomer, now we get later sunsets, and you get to July where you can't see a thing until about 10 o'clock at night. On December 22nd, late in the evening, there's the Ursid meteor shower, and they radiate right near the bowl of the little dipper in the northern sky. This is not a very good shower. You probably see 10 an hour, but because of the rarity, it might be worth just to go outside, give it a half hour, and see if you can see a couple of the Ursid meteors. How many of you have ever seen an Ursid meteor? Nobody. I'll ask the same question next month. How many of you have seen a nurse in meteor? Friday, December 27th, the uh, Cooksing variable algol will be at minimum. It goes from about second magnitude down to about three and a half, so it dims noticeably as its companion passes in front of it. And we did an observing party one time with a club. We checked that star out. It took about a four hour period to see it go from its regular brightness fade, and it was noticeable after a period of time, and for those who never saw a star fade, that's an amazing thing. To see a, see a star just noticeably get dimmer, and then suddenly get brighter again. I'm thinking of holding a thing at the clubhouse, but because of the holiday situation, I never know what's going on day to day, I don't know, but if it looks like I'm going to be free that night, and it looks like we're going to have some good weather, uh, I'd be glad to meet some of you at the clubhouse to maybe check out that particular eclipse. Saturday, December 8th, 40 minutes after sunset, and this is again for all of you, Venus, or not Venus, uh, yeah, Venus and a crescent moon will be paired up in the evening sky about 40 minutes after sunset. So this is on Saturday, December 8th, it'll be low in the southwest sky, and you'll see the moon like this, and Venus just a little bit above it, about 40 minutes after sunset, and that's a pretty sight to see those two together. And finally, Saturday, January 4th, in the early morning, and this is really early morning, we're probably talking about 4 a.m., which is tough, but one of the richest meteor showers, and very little known as the quadranted meteors, which are near the constellation of Udis, look in the northeast sky, three to four, you know, most of us probably don't get up, but if you find you, you gotta get up at four in the morning to go to the bathroom, you're already up anyway, just step outside <laughs> if you got a northeast horizon, and give it about five or 10 minutes. And when this meteor shower is at peak activity, you can see over 100 meteors in an hour. So it might be worth it if you just happen to be up on that particular morning. Next, and I'll go through these quickly because it is late. Our uh, observer's challenge for the month is, is IC 1805. It's in the Mission Nebula in uh, Cassiopeia. And I don't know how well you can see it. Can we dim the lights without killing everybody over in the row there? Look at the size of it. It's called the Heart Nebula. And to give you an idea of the size, there's the whole constellation of Cassiopeia. So this thing is big. It's also faint. And I have not had a chance to see it. Has anybody here, I think some of you have seen the Heart Nebula. Uh, you did it with a 32 inch, right? No, 6 inch. So you can see it with a 6 you, you imaged it with a 6 I inch. I imaged it with the 6 How about? I can see parts of it with 32. As long as the moon's out of the way. As long as the moon's out of the way. Okay, you've all read my report. I saw it in a three-quarter inch image intensifier. Oh, that's right, the image intensifier. Anybody seen it just with the eye without any photography or any imaging in intensifiers? Yes. I heard a yes somewhere. Up top me, Chris. Oh, there you are, yeah. Yeah, so um, we were at a clubhouse a couple weekends ago and it was we were doing uh, a 102 millimeter refractor uh, let's About see. Four inch, okay. Yeah, so we, uh, I think I did, I did the best view was actually amusingly enough through a hydrogen beta filter. Okay, yep. Yeah. Um, but even with just the U, with UHC, you could, you could vaguely, you could definitely see that the area had a higher brightness 
than the surrounding area. Uh, getting a edge for the heart was kind of difficult, but you could you could do it with the hydrogen beta if you really looked at it for long enough. You could kind of see some of the brighter edging. Yeah. I'm going to try it with an astro scan. For those who are not familiar, that's a little four inch telescope. It's a very high power telescope, very low. Uh, it's a very high, a low power telescope, excuse me, very wide field. And I'm going to try it with a, uh, a nebula filter and see what I get out of it. But we've had a lot of cloudy skies lately. By the way, my granddaughter loves clouds. There's where I disagree. Yeah. <laughs> the, the edge is all H alpha, there's no oxygen on it. Or, but yes, that's the right. Inside, it's all oxygen, it's very much separated. So if you use an O3 filter, you're gonna get a glow in the center. You can see that in my subs. Yep. But the uh, if you, you need an H beta if you wanna see the edge. I think we got the pictures coming up. You see the position though relative to Cassiopeia, and I've got a chart up there. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, yeah, These are the images we had. Doug Paul's, I believe, is this one. Doug's here? Yes. That's yours. Yep. And this is Mario's over here. And by the way, the thing that lights up this whole uh, area, this is about a degree and a half, two degrees across. This is a big object. But there's a cluster right in here. It's called Malat 15. It's a bunch of very hot, very massive stars. These stars are 50 times heavier than the sun. Uh, the cluster's only about a million years old, a million and a half years old. These stars are going to start going supernova any time because they're already pretty much running along in the lifetime of a star of that size. All right, anybody have any questions? Okay, keep looking up. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, our speaker, Bobic, will now speak about. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who attended today. It was, uh, it was a great Maria. night. Maria. And, Mar and uh, obviously, Maria. Week for Bruce, who's taking over next month, uh, because the competition is fierce. And um, I haven't, I haven't uh, got a speaker yet that has committed, but I will uh, hopefully be able to present that to you uh, by email and on social media very soon. So thanks again for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. And with that, I'll close the meeting. Thank you.